Hello, everybody, and welcome to BSing with Sean K. I'm your host, Sean Neese. Joining me today from the United Kingdom is popular YouTuber, stand up comedian, and host of the Left Wing Propaganda Machine podcast, Richard the Dick Coughlin. Dick, it's great to have you on. It's very nice to have you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that grandiose intro. Like <laughs> putting, the, putting the word popular in the middle of it. As, 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 I, I, did a, I did a talk at my old college a couple of years ago, and the woman introduced me as Richard Coughlin, a famous comedian. And just like the audience was like, oh, I've never heard of this. <laughs> this is, this is it's, like, it's like being famous. Being famous is like saying you're good in bed. If you if you have to keep telling everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so, thanks for that. Okay. Uh, well, well, you have like uh, eighteen thousand subscribers or so. That's you know that's not bad, right? <laughs> Well, actually, I don't anymore. I mean, I, I did, I did have them. I don't at the moment because I, uh, obviously, because I lost my channel a couple of months ago for the fourth time with the, with, with the, no, it's, it's nothing. Not, with the man trying to keep me down and on such as such. <laughs> no, but, uh, no. but, uh, but I, I, I've, 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 I've flitted between. I think my my peak was I've, I've peaked at thirty thousand before, but I've never managed to get much past that before. My channels always get destroyed. So. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, why is that? Is uh, YouTube doesn't like your content? Or... There's nothing to do. I mean, YouTube don't give a toss about anyone's content. It's the people who uh, people who watch it, really, don't they? Um, it's um, no, I've just had this. I, I have this habit of annoying the wrong people. Oh, and they um, flag your videos. And, yeah. yeah, videos get flagged. Oh, the, 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 the point I stopped counting. Um, if you count, if you just go with videos that have had fake copyright claims on them, or they've had fake privacy claims or they've been flagged. It, it came close to 200 in the last, like, six years. Um, that's not including videos that were on my channels when they got taken down. <laughs> so it's, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm on my fourth main channel at the moment in six years. And I just, uh, yeah, I mean, the thing is, it doesn't really matter what you talk about, really. You're going to get people flag your videos. But yeah. if you talk about, if you talk about, I mean, I imagine, like, if you're, if you're doing something like Epic Meal Time or that, you're probably not going to get flagged yeah. too much because you're not, you're not really being that contentious. Um, but, um, well, I imagine some animal rights nutters would probably, uh, would probably flag them or something. But, yeah, so, uh, if you, if you deal with the kind of loonies I, deal with on a daily basis then uh yeah it's 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 it's, it's not keep playing still has it i'm afraid and uh so I'll, I'll start off asking about uh your comedy uh how did you first develop your passion for comedy and what were some of your early experiences performing <coughs> i i actually i actually uh, wanted to do stand-up uh from the age of nine hmm. um which is kind of a, a rare thing i mean i i'm i'm a bit of a i'm a bit of a comedy nerd i mean everyone sort of like when i was growing up as a teenager, everyone was listening to Nirvana and Soundgarden and Pearl Jam and things like that, you know, just and grunge music, and then they get listening to Oasis. And I was listening to like I was listening to like Eddie Izzard and Lee Evans and watching Billy Connolly and stuff like that. But I mean, I got into it when I was nine years old. My um, my dad, I was going through my dad's vinyl collection when I was nine, and he had a Billy Connolly. Uh, record, and I couldn't understand a word Billy Connolly said. Um, and of course, the jokes at the age of nine, the jokes are kind of going over your head. Um, but you know, he's got a funny voice and he swears a lot, which is really at the age of nine all all you need. <laughs> he's, he's just doing, doing he's, got, he's just talking about a wee jobby, is a wee jobby in the toilet, and that's just that's really all you all you really need. And then. Um, and I, I did, but I think it's, when you grow up, is you like everyone wants to be like everyone wants to be like a, a, a rock star, or they want to be a film star, or be a footballer, and that. But you you kind of have this idea that these people fall out of the sky; they're not human. Do you know what I mean? They're like yeah. <laughs> you don't. You, they're, they're not. They're, they're like that. If you want to be a pop star, you look at David Bowie. You go, David Bowie is like he's not normal, is he? He's not like from this planet. So I couldn't just go him out and be something like that. Um, so. I never really considered uh, considered doing it as such, but then I um I did a uh, I did act I actually trained to be a chef, mm. believe it or not. Uh, was my was what I originally went to college for, and then I did two years of acting at college and did really well at that. And then I had the choice when I left of like you know sh shall I go to drama school 
or can I do something else? And I, I just didn't feel like going to drama school. So I just looked into how you go about doing stand-up, um, which is getting a copy of the local listings and just finding the new act comedy nights, of which there are there are thousands of them. And you just phone people up, and you just it's a case of just ringing around, getting yourself booked in. I did my first gig. It was, uh, November, it was November 28th, 2001, hmm. many, many, many years ago. And um, uh, yeah, it was in a pub called The Coach and Horses in London, the smallest comedy club in the country at the time. Uh, I, think it was, I think there were about 20 people in the room. Um, and that was include, that's, include, uh, that's including probably the acts on the stage as well. And I went, I went, on, I went on sixth. And uh, yeah, and it went really well. And um, and just from that, you just go from there, there, there on. Really, you just kept get, sort of kept doing it. I did my first, um, I did my first comedy. Uh, I did my first Edinburgh festival in two thousand six. I've done how many have I done of them now? I think I've done five Edinburgh festivals now. I've done like three Brighton festivals. Uh, I've done a Camden festival, uh, Glasgow. You just sort of go around, and you just and you just sort of keep plodding along, really. Um, but that's really where it came from. It's just, it was just something I was always interested in. I've always been, I've always been fascinated by. It. And uh, I would say, as well, maybe I'm a bit biased. I'm sorry if you talk to anyone who does anything, they'll they'll probably have their own uh, view on this. But I mean, I've, I've always felt that comedy is it's the last sort of it's the last sort of true. It's the it's the rawest and most honest form of of expression yeah. because once you've got once you've got a guy. Once you you book a comedian, you've you've got a guy on stage. He literally can say anything he wants at that point, and there's a certain danger, dangerous element to that. I mean, you go see a band, you know they're going to play certain songs. You don't expect too much, uh, too much else other than that. Uh, or you go see a play, or you go see a, a film or whatever. But you go see a guy. Once a guy is standing on stage, he's going to have his routine. But if he felt like it, he could go off and say anything. And there's that kind of. Um, that's always sort of a uh, that's one of the sort of edgier elements to stand up, and um, so I've just always felt that it's it, I've always felt that about it that it's got this, and there's a simplicity to it as well. I'm, I'm, I've always been a bit of a minimalist. I've always been drawn to things that uh, you know make the most out of the least, and there's nothing there's nothing more minimal than just stand, a bloke on stage with a microphone um, just talking, or you know, or just someone on stage with a microphone. It just sort of uh, it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a simplicity, a simple beauty to it. And uh, what can you say about your experiences with uh, hecklers? Have you grown thicker skin over the years? Or? <laughs> uh, hecklers, I actually have a routine about this. Uh, I actually have a routine about hecklers. Uh, hecklers. Hecklers are an occupational hazard, but they're not something that happens very often. They're not something you prepare for, really. Um, some people are better at dealing with, with them than others. Um I've tended never to have too much. I tend not to have too much of a problem with them, um, mainly due to the fact that I think it depends on your act. I mean, I, I'm quite sort of, I'm quite, I, I come across as quite aggressive or quite sort of, uh, I'm quite energetic and angry or, or, or sort of on stage, and that, and as a result, people don't tend to want to heckle me because they they, they they think I'm just going to jump off the stage and eat their head or something. So it, it tends not to be a problem for me. Um, but there, there, there are, there are always. There's this one uh, example I bring up. I'll actually do. I'll actually tell you. So the, my favourite one that happened in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, I was doing a gig in Northern Ireland, and a guy uh, as I walked on stage. I haven't even started talking, and the guy, uh, a guy in the front said, "Like, excuse me." He's like, he's like, "Are you gay?" Like, just asking me this, just as I walked on stage, asking me if I, I was gay, and. Um, this, if, 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 the, if the audience don't know what I look like, this won't work. But it, it, you just got to imagine I'm just this. Uh, uh, I've got, I've got, this, I'm quite, I'm very, very thin. Got this, uh, I've got very pale skin, bags under my eyes. So I've got this, and I said to him, "Why do you think I'm gay?" And he says, "Cause you look like you've got AIDS." Right? And that's what he's. And this is what happened. And this is like live. Everyone sort of like goes really tense in that. And I was there for about twenty seconds trying to figure out how to respond to this. And I looked down at the guy, and he was laughing. So I just spat at him. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, he, and he just got that. I got, uh, and my, my response was then, I don't know if I've got AIDS, sir, but in six months you will. Can you send me an email? And that was sort of like, uh, that was it. But other than that, I mean, hecklers are, are you know, they're, 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 they're not something that's encouraged in, in comedy. I mean, a lot of comedy clubs will kick you out 
if you're heckling too much or if you're being too disruptive. Because, uh, you know, I, and the, the, unfortunately the problem is a lot of people, they get this idea that, oh, you know, if you're a heck, you know, heckling's part of it. And, like, and like you know, yeah, we're just trying to add to the show. And it's like, you're not. You're not really. Just, you know, if you want to add to the show, you know, then go write an act, you know what I mean, and book yourself in. But, yeah, but my, my experience with hecklers is not, is, is um, it's one of those ones I've, I've tended to avoid it a lot. But there's some people who have, who I think have more problems with it than others. But um, And I think I, yeah. I saw you use that in uh, your routine once. Uh, the, the yes, area. yes. Uh, there's, there's, look, there is another story as well about a blind guy who heckled me in, in clap. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, the, he was at the front, and the, my response to him was, you know, uh, you know, if you're blind, why are you sitting at the front of the fucking <laughs> audience for yourself, you bastard? Because there's, there's no, there's no nothing. You're not getting anything out of that. So, um, but yeah, so uh, but yeah, th- those are the only two real sort of significant ones. The rest of them are just people who they. Hang, and it's one of those things. It's like you either over the course of time, you just either you develop. You because you, the thing about hecklers is they're, they're by 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 the very nature of being a heckler, they're not. They're not the most imaginative people. They they're not sort of like they're not the people who you got to worry about. So they're they're very limited in their in what they can say back to you. And you've just got to realise that all I've got to do is top. You got to top them, you know, quickly. And so you got to put you got to be able to say anything uh, to, uh, to to sort of put them put them in their place. And then once they realise that, they'll either carry on, in which case they'll get chucked out, or they just shut up. Uh, of embarrassment. And uh, what were some of your favorite gigs you performed, and why? Oh, favorite gig. Again, again, I mean, I, I love the Edinburgh Festival. I do love doing the Edinburgh Festival. I've been, I'm, I'm not doing it this year. I've done it for the last two years now. I've done it. I've done it five times in total. And it's just, it, it, if no one's ever, if you've never been to the Edinburgh Festival, anyone's never been to the Edinburgh Festival, it, it, to me it's like, it's it's just, you've got to go. It's just such a, you go there, it's just like, there's like 1,800 shows on, ranging from people in the street juggling knives, there's, there's street theatre, there's people, there's, there's people doing darts, people doing, there's art galleries, there's, there's a film festival that's going on. There's actually there's an interesting one. There's an Islam festival that happens at the same time because there's a there's a big mosque in uh, in Edinburgh. So there's there's the Islam festival that happens at the same time. There's a book festival. There's the art there's art gallery fest there's art gallery art festivals going on, and then you've got the comedy festival at the same time. And they just uh, and it's just I, I would just recommend that any, any, going to that is and just doing that doing an hour every day for 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 three weeks on the trot it's just it's a very draining experience but um i, I mean that's always been my favorite place to go brighton as well brighton as well as a great as a great thing but i mean it's amazing how t- it sounds really it's, it sounds really really sad when you sit and go how tiring it is doing uh just doing an hour a day but um it, it does really take it does really take it out of you um but uh yeah, so, so I'd say probably the Edinburgh Festival is my favourite place. As far as gigs in UK venues that were always, I always enjoyed. Comedy Store is always a, a good one. Uh, it's just, it's just a great venue. Uh, but it's, uh, but other than that, I would say definitely the festivals are the more fun. I remember, I think, my, I think the most I ever did, I think it was, I think it was the second year I did Edinburgh. I did 82 gigs in three weeks and just, just shattered by the end of it. I did five in a day. <laughs> Once, and my last, my last gig, my last gig was at three in three in the morning, <laughs> <laughs> in um, in a, in a place called the Comedy Theatre, in a place called the Theatre Royale in in Edinburgh. I just, you know, in a it just this piss, much piss stain smelling room, and it was there was, a, there was about seventeen people there. But it's like, I'm like well, what are you going to do at three a.m.? I don't even remember what I did. It was that I was that bewildered by that point, and. Uh... So, were there any comedians you enjoyed sharing the stage with, in particular? Um, as far as comedians, well, I mean, I've met I've met a lot of. Uh, com- I mean, uh, the thing about doing, the thing about when you do a gig with another comedian, it's it it doesn't really affect you. Um, <coughs> whether you're doing a gig on your own or doing a gig with another comedian, it doesn't really affect you as much because you're either going to do well or you're not, and. Um, and so uh, there's, I mean, there's lots of comedians out there who I who I enjoy, but I mean, um, 
uh, as far as whether I'm on stage with them or not, it really makes no difference um, whatsoever wh whether you're on stage with them or not. Um, because uh, you, you're either going to, I said, you're either going to, the audience are either going to like you or not. They're not going to like you more because, you know, because Doug, Stuart Lee's on before <laughs> you or Stuart Lee's on after. They're not going to find you any better just because of that. They're, just, they're, they're either going to, uh, I mean, a lot, a lot of people, a lot of people don't like gigging with um, with popular mm. comedians um, because they feel that there's more pressure on them. But I mean, my attitude was always at the end of the day, it's like I, I'm, I want to be at that level. You know, what I mean, I want to be at the, if I want to be at the top level, then I've got to, I've got, I've, I've got to be competing or feel if I, if I feel like it, I've got to feel like I've got, I can just slip in. In between, you know, Reg Hunter and Dara O'Brien, I can just slip in between those guys, and um, no one's gonna, no, and it's it's not gonna make any difference. To, you know, so, for me, that was always more fun. But um, yeah. And how does uh, does the United Kingdom, uh, the scene in the United Kingdom, how does it differ from like other places? Well, interestingly, I mean, I, America, I always feel was like America's always been. Uh, you know, decades ahead. I mean, America was like the most innovative country in terms of stand-up. I mean, for, for you, I mean, in the fifties and the sixties, you had George Carlin and Lenny Bruce, who were you know just miles, miles ahead. I mean, in this country, we had to wait until like the nineteen eighties before we got any decent stand-up, because before that, it was just a load of a load of shitty jokes <laughs> told by blokes in frilly shirts with velvet jackets. Doing jokes about oh my mother-in-law <laughs> and, uh, and is it this Irishman? There's an Irishman, a Jew, and a Pakistani, and and a, and, a, and, a, and an Indian bloke, and a fucking and a black guy, and it's it's all it's just all these terrible <laughs> it was all these terrible stereotypes that were all the same. Like the Irishman was always stupid, the Indian bloke always had a corner shop, the Chinese bloke had a laundrette, the you know the French guy was smelly, the German guy was a Nazi, the Italian guy was it was just always just, just dreadful, and then. But I think in terms of stand up now, um, I actually think I mean a, a lot of American comedians come over uh, to Britain and they actually prefer it because there's just it's just such a smaller because the country's so small. It's like you don't have to. There's no travel involved as such. I mean, Bill Hicks always said that he preferred yeah. uh, gigging in Britain, and uh, and a lot of comedians. I know, there's a lot of Canadian comics, a lot of uh, a lot of American comics. I know. Who just come over to Britain, and it's a lot easier. For, and plus, there's there's always the added appeal of like of being a foreigner in another country uh, doing doing material because like you can you can do jokes about them yeah. from a perspective that, that, that you couldn't do if you were if you were from that country. So um, so I think definitely now I mean I definitely pref I, I definitely think it's uh, I, I, if I was in America I don't know how I would. Um, uh, how I could even begin to uh, do stand up because you just got uh, each each little each state's got its own scene and its own little uh, its own little um, uh, circuit that you've got to travel around to go and do and so getting getting seen or picked up is just going to be is just going to be a nightmare I imagine um, and the new acts I was talking to one guy and he was telling me about the new act nights in uh, California or Los Angeles. And he, and he said, like, you turn up and there's, like, 25 acts and you get, like, three minutes and stuff. And they just keep churning them out and stuff. And so it just sounded like a nightmare to me. Um, but, yeah, I, def I definitely prefer the uh, – in terms of the stand-up, I definitely prefer the British stand-up scene to uh, do anywhere else. But I do think – I do think America uh, was much more – you know, was, like I said, was decades ahead of everyone in terms of a, a innovative and uh, original stand-up. Yeah, well, no, and a lot of the good stand-ups still around have been around a while, mm. you know, from America, like uh, Doug Stanhope yeah. or Louis C.K., mm. you know, they've been around a while. Well, I mean, Doug Stanhope, Doug Stanhope like, for those cases where Doug Stanhope's never going to be, I mean, he's too he's too raw to be, and yeah. ever to be that <laughs> famous, but I mean, he, he, yeah, he's been going, I mean, he's like, uh, I think he's been going, he was going 20 years when I heard of him, and that was about, mm. he's probably been going 25 years now. I mean, it just gives you an idea of a lot of the... Um, of how long it takes. Um, if you, in, indeed, if your if your goal is to get recognised or to get on TV or to get famous or have a DVD or have whatever out, um, you know you're, you're going to be doing it a hell of a long time. And um, a lot of guys, I mean, a lot of guys I uh, you know, who are famous over here, on a, a, who I'd heard of, they've been going. You know, I'd only just started started hearing about them. It's like oh, they've been going sixteen, 
16, 17 years. So it's, it's, it, you have to, you have to be prepared to put, it. sometimes it can, it, it depends if you get things, like some people get picked up a lot sooner. Uh, but depending on your, on your act, you know, you can be waiting, it, it can be a long, long time before anyone's even recognized you. And uh, what would you say about your style of comedy and how has it changed or progressed since the time you started till now? Um, I, I've got, you know what, that's always something I always, I, I never know how to answer that when people talk about my style of comedy because I always feel that's for other people to, to I mean, I think, I think when I, when I, when I, <coughs> when I started, I fell into that trap of, you see this with a lot of young comics, a lot of young, it tends to be a young person's uh, a thing that happens to you when you're young. It's like, oh, you've got to go out there. You've got to be as, as offensive and as edgy. You've got to say anything you can. And you soon realise that that's a, that that's a bit of, you know, it's a bit of a waste of time. That I mean, because <clears throat> we live in we live in an era now where this idea of like the comedian who says who says things that are unsayable, it's yeah. it's gone. I mean, there's not there is nothing that there's no there's no longer anything that's unsayable anymore and there's no longer anything that hasn't already been said i mean there was a time yeah when doing jokes about abortion or using or jokes about uh maybe pedophilia or maybe jokes about cancer or jokes about or anything or jokes about third world hunger or jokes about domestic violence or anything like that. doing jokes about anything like that they would have been um they, they would have been edgy in a, it would have been edgy to do them just in and of themselves but in this day and age it really isn't and um, you also learn that being offensive is not something that's, you know, being, a, being offensive is not something you should deliberately set out to do. Um, yeah. You either are, because, you know, uh, George Carlin or uh, Bill Hicks or Richard Pryor, they, they, they never set out to be offensive. They just did what they thought was funny. And that happens to be a style that is considered. But, I mean, I've always said there's no such thing as an offensive joke. Um, yeah. Because if... If you find it funny and you recognise it's a joke, then it's not offensive. But if you if you're offended by something, then it's clear. Not there are a lot of people who use comedy as a way of just being offensive. Um, yeah, oh, they'll well, just, well, like they'll, uh, Daniel Tosh. I don't get why. I mean, I, I've heard of Daniel <laughs> Tosh. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've, I've I've heard of him. But, but you get this a lot with people. You get a lot of pun people who are like they'll <clears throat> they'll come out and they'll 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 be on TV and they'll or they'll they'll have their little. Uh, outlet and they'll say things that are really really dodgy and then when you when you sort of bring them up or they get in trouble they'll say oh it's just a joke and it is like and that's it and it's like that's their get out of um it happens on youtube <laughs> quite a lot is one thing <laughs> I, I have this i have this massive chip on my shoulder about this this phrase youtube comedian uh that oh, is yeah. a phrase that I, it just it really winds me up because it's just uh, a lot of people just they that they come out and then they get in trouble for something. It's like, oh, it was a joke. I was just being. Oh, it was satire. I'm like, well, of what? You know, I mean, it's like, and, um, and so yeah. So, but my style is. But I think if anything, my style. It's. I mean, it's. <clears throat> I've always been a bit. I've never been one to write. I mean, there's, there's people like Jerry Seinfeld's a good example of a guy who is just in, the most disciplined performer. When you go watch him, I've seen. You know, you can watch Jerry Seinfeld three nights on the trot, and it's the same routine every night and everything's the same. Everything from the pauses in between the gags to like the movement, like if he puts his hand in his jacket or he takes out and every, it's exactly the same. And I've never been like that. I've always kind of just had, I'd like to, I like to keep things a little bit loose. Um, but definitely, definitely now I think I'm a lot more sort of, I think a lot more about what I am when I write a joke now. I'm, um, I won't just, uh, I won't just write a joke and, uh, do it. And if it gets me, I, I've got to, I've got to be able to justify, uh, a joke to myself. And, uh, and the, the, there's two ways to justify it. There's a, mor there's a moral justification and there's an artistic justification. It's like, it's very easy. Like when a celebrity dies, um, there's always these people that will trot out the jokes quickly. You, you get it all the time. Like people will send you jokes on a text message and stuff like that. And to me, it's like, right, is there, you know, I could do a joke about, let's say, Amy Winehouse dies or something like that. It's like, I could do a joke about that, but is there any reason for me to make fun of Amy Winehouse dying? Is there, is she, did she ever really do anything that warranted mockery? And the answer is probably no. And it's certainly not to me. And then artistically, it's like, even if I do come up with a good joke, 
is there any point to it? Is it just me making fun of someone who's dead? And so nowadays there's a lot more <coughs> thought into it. I think if anything, it's like it's like whereas political correctness has always been something that's been derided in in comedy and that like because uh, people say a joke and like it's you know whether it's it uses language or it's a little bit near the mark. I think nowadays it's actually something that a lot of people use quite clearly. So you can you can, you can tell a joke that that it sounds on the surface to be quite you know, obscene or offensive, but actually it's like, it's actually, there's, a, there's, it come, it's where, it, it's where I suppose your, where does your comedy come from? And, um, you know, and mine always comes from, it doesn't come from a place of hatred, you know, mm-hmm. and, um, that's the way I sort of look at it. It comes from a place of, you know, a lot of my stuff's about, you know, is about racial, you know, about racism and about uh, sexism, homophobia, you know, prejudiced in general, sort of, you know, extremisms in politics, you know, and stuff like that, because I spend most of my time dealing with, like, far-right political groups, you know, or racist groups, or this, that, and the other, and so, and so when you're dealing with that, you've got a sort of, you know, my, 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 and a lot of people will do stand, will do comedy, and they'll do it from that place where they hate, like, they'll make fun of minorities, or gays, or women, because they hate, because they, they've got that, innate bigotry in them and there comes a sort of that sort of comes across and for me it's like that's when comedy sort of loses a a bit of its appeal to me when I feel that it's coming from a place uh, a place of hatred and uh, what's overall the most difficult part of performing stand-up um to be honest, there's none. I mean, not anymore. I mean, once you've got, it's one of those things. I mean, it's like, it, it, I mean, you, you do still get, I do still get the butterflies and I get nervous before a gig. Um, but that's more excitement about wanting to get on stage and do it because you don't get to do it that much. I mean, it's not something, it's not like your average job where you go and you do it eight hours a day or 40, 45 hours a week and then you go home. Um, so when you get a chance to do it, it's, uh, it's it's exciting, but um, I suppose the only hard part, the only time when it's ner- it's quite d- difficult, is if you're if you're trying out new material, because that's obviously that's when, you know, you've got to sort of take the risk of like this is going to be crap, because no matter how long you've been, no matter how long you've been writing, um, you know, I could sit here and write. I mean, it, it, it happens. Everyone, every comedian will tell you there's that one joke they've got where they've sat down and they've written it and they thought that's it. That is the joke. That is this is this is it from now on. Uh, this is this is my legacy. This is how you know I'm gonna get. This will go down in history as the greatest joke ever written by anyone. And then you go and perform it, and it's like nothing, not a sodding laugh from it. No one gives a toss. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, 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 and it's like just crickets throughout the room. And you try it now. No matter how many times you try it, you're like, why is this not funny? Why am I the? Only? And then you get these jokes you write that you're like. Eh, that's all right. That's a faraway line, and it just everyone's like, "Oh, it's brilliant!" as laughing. So you you never you can never really tell. Um, you can never really tell with with new material, but like new material is just uh, that's the only time when it's difficult. But that's just you know it's only difficult because you just you know you've got a it takes time to develop new material, and you've got unfortunately stand up's one of those stand up is a bit like having sex. You can't get good at it before you've tried it. You know? <laughs> it's like. You have to, you, in order to, in order to get good at it, you have to do it a lot of times before, and you know, and uh, so, and then eventually, after a while, you'll just, you know, you'll just, you'll get your technique down, and you'll be in, with the right, in front of the right person, and then <laughs> it'll all, it'll all happen, you know. And uh, so, what's the latest news with your comedy? What do you have planned next? Uh, <clears throat> well, the last time I was, uh, um, last, uh, uh, I've, well, I've spent the last few years doing a show. Uh, called Eat a Queer Fetus for Jesus. Um, <laughs> as, as you can tell, like I said, I've refined my stuff a lot more. <laughs> um, but yeah, I spent a few years doing that. That was a show that was, took a long time to get to get right. Um, I actually began writing that. Um, it was ba- it's based primarily on one half hour routine, uh, which is based on which is a true story of my girlfriend having an abortion in two thousand and six, um, and. It took a while to be able to get a show to build around that, and uh, so it took about it took about five six years. And then I did, I basically performed that uh, for the last couple of years. I've performed that all over uh, all over the place. I've done it. In, I've done it in London. I've done it. I've done, I said, done it up in Edinburgh, Brighton. Done it in um, did it in uh, Camden Festival, a couple of other places. And so, but now I'm sort of moving on. To, I, I'm currently working on a the, the show. I'm, I'm trying to write a new show as it is now. And uh, I originally had two 
uh, titles for it. The first one was called was called uh, Anti White Politically Correct Manginas Activate, which uh, <coughs> which was the first one. And then I and then I had an idea for a second one. It was the Thoughts of Chairman Lamau. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> and uh, and the, pro- the problem was it was like I thought I didn't know which one to go for, so I posted it on Facebook saying which one should I go for. And the overall world was like, I should use both. So now, <laughs> so, so now my next show will be called Anti-White PC Manginas Activate, <laughs> colon, The Thoughts of Chairman Lamau, which is, um, which will hopefully get, which, which, I mean, I've always gone for the title, I've always gone for the eye-catching title, because that generally, <clears throat> Eat a Queer Fetus for Jesus, I didn't have to do, I never had to advertise that show, because people would see it, and they'd be like, right, I've got to see that show. And that's sort of, I've always gone for the idea, like, if I've got a title, like, I want to pick a title where if I read it, I'd be like, I want to see that show, just, just on the title alone. So I figured that would be, that would be a good enough one. But, I mean, it's going to be, it's always going to be along the same lines. There's no sort of, uh, I never write with an idea of, like, thinking, right, I want to write a show <coughs> about this. Um, I, I wanted to, I don't, I want to write a show with this theme. This is, li- I, I literally just write until I've got enough material. And then it becomes, then comes the case of putting it together and constructing it and putting it into a, um, putting it into a set. And so that's what I'm sort of working on at the moment. So what can you tell us about your, uh, videos Mm. and what motivated you to start making them? Um, my first, uh, when I started making them, primarily the reason I started making them was literally just because I was bored. And, um, I had nothing, it was 2008, 4th of July, 2008, easy date to remember. Um, but I was, uh, I'd done Edinburgh Festival the previous couple of years and, uh, I, it was, it was like July and I wasn't doing the Edinburgh Festival in, in 2008. So I thought I want to do something that, you know, what's going to fill the time in there, sort of keep me from getting bored or distracted. And I'd been on YouTube, um, as a sort of, as, just as a spectator for a couple of years and I'd seen people I'd, I'd run into certain other people who had and seen other people who were making these videos that was just sort of like people responding to someone else or about this that, and the other and I thought you know I could do this you know this is this, this, this would be something to give it a go and so I did and I just sort of went on there I mean I, I never came on there with a with, again I never really had an agenda that went beyond the sort of you know, just the acquiring, the acquisition of, of nutters. I mean, that was really it. I, I realised, I mean, I, I like sort of, I, I sort of like nutters. And uh, particularly nutters that are new, not obvious nutters. Not not nutters who are like, who you feel sorry for. You know I mean? Not those, but uh, people who are like, uh, people who, you know, have just got, have just and have these insane and, and, and absolute, and, and to this day, I, 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 every week, I will see something, I'll see a video, or I'll read a comment, or I'll get a message, and I'll go, that is the stupidest, that is the most insane thing I've ever seen in my life, and I'm, nothing's ever going to top that. And then by the following week, I'm like, no, this is the most insane, stupidest thing. And um, <clears throat> and I came on there, I'd never used, I'd never done video before, I'd never done anything on video, and so <clears throat> I figured it would just be a good outlet, good way, and also the other thing about YouTube is there's no pressure, uh, there's no pressure on you, because you're not, you're not working for anyone. You don't have to produce a certain that you do. And also, it's one of those cases where the audience find you, and um, you know you just put it out there. And if people like it, they stay. And if they don't, they don't. And um, uh, whereas with stand up, you go to a venue, and whoever's there, you've got that's who you've got. Um, it's a much, but I mean, it, it's a thousand times easier than doing stand up. Um, but I mean, really, as it developed, I mean. Um, as it developed, my sort of just idea, beca- I mean, the idea became, like, I'm just going to do whatever, whatever videos, whatever I feel like making, I'll make, but, um, and, but I'm, I just wanted it to, I didn't want to become, as it goes on, there's a lot, there's a, there's a, there's a problem on YouTube with a lot of people who make videos, and after a while, they become very, it, it's, it's like a Scooby-Doo cartoon, where they're running in the background, and it's like, it's the, you know, it's the, you know, uh, door, window, cactus, plant, door, window, and it's just the same thing over and over again, and I never wanted to do that, I always wanted to make sure that whatever I was doing was different, and so like, you didn't know what sort of video I was going to upload next, and uh, you know, and you ask most people what their, <coughs> what their favourite sort of type of video I've done is, they're, 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 there's none of them that are really the same, there's, 
you know, I've done, my videos can be serious, they could be, you know, quite, uh, <coughs> they could be quite cathartic, they could be, you know, ridiculous, they could be like, it could be a parody, it could be a comedy sketch, it could be, uh, it could just be something random that I found, it could just be responding, a deb- it could be a, a report, a sort of a report on something. It's, there's no real one issue or subject that I sort of stick to. <coughs> and I, I, I kind of like it that way, because I don't like falling into this habit of, of fall, uh, of getting because there was this problem where when I started I was doing lots of videos about re- responding to religious people and I fell into this um, trap of being part of the online atheist community um, and then after which was fine for a while but then after a few years I realised that the online atheist community were just as fucking annoying as everyone else <laughs> so like you ended up <laughs> so I, and of course you I mean I, I think that's one thing I've learnt now when people say the main difference I've learnt between atheists and religious people is with religious people you can find out what religion they are and you can pretty much figure out what what little bits and pieces of crazy silliness they're going to have within them you know, like if they say, you know, you can figure out what, you know, roughly, you know, what they're going to, whereabouts they're going to be. Whereas if atheists, each one's got their own little personal individual set of insane, crazy, stupid beliefs that you then have to find out um, one at a time. And I, and I say this, and I say this as an atheist, obviously, who who accepts that probably most of the stuff I believe is raging horseshit. So I, I, before anyone, <laughs> unless anyone gets offended by that. Um, so what led you to becoming an atheist? Uh, nothing led me to it. I've never been, I've always sort of been one. I mean, it's really one of these, this was another thing that I kind of lost. I never really got the, I suppose, I mean, I can, <clears throat> I suppose if, if I had been someone who had grown up in a sort of very religious, uh, environment, um, family, whatever, and it had been very sort of, it had been a very orthodox, strict religious environment, and I did, and there was this, you know, and that I became <coughs> cast away or something, or was mistreated because I didn't believe in God. But I can understand why a lot of people have this aggressive attitude. They come out of it and they have this very anti, anti-theistic, uh, militant angriness to them. And I just never had that because, I mean, I, I grew up in Britain where religion is... You know, I mean, it's just no, no one gives a toss over here. I mean, we've got we invented the Church of England over here, which <coughs> which is as close to atheism as you get while still technically believing in God. Although, to be honest, that isn't a, even a massive requirement from the church that you even do that. Um, so, like, a, a religion was just never anything that was a massive part of my life. I found it fascinating. I'd always been interested in it. I mean, I've been interested in it since I was a kid. Um, and I've been, I've been, I think I remember having like my first discussions about it when I was like 14 or something like that. And so it was always something I found interesting. But like in America, when I talk to a lot of Americans who I know, uh, they have this, their attitude towards, like, they're always shocked to find out that there's no creationists over here. Mm. Like in America, there's a, I mean, I've met, I mean, in, in 20 years since I've been, in my entire life, I've met three creationists and two of them were these two sisters who had just moved in from South Africa down to, so <laughs> even they weren't from this country. And the other one was this one guy who worked at Southampton University. And that's really all, all of, you've, you've ever, all, all I've ever uh, met in the way of creationists. Whereas in America, they're just, they're just all over the bloody place. And so, um, so yeah, but nothing led me to, it. I don't think anything leads anyone. I mean, I'm, I'm, I've, always, I'm, I've, I've always been the, uh, been of the opinion that, you know, we, you you spend most of your life, your early life, up until the age of almost eighteen. Nothing, you know, all your decisions are made for you. Your your everything's chosen for you. Where you go, what you see, what you do, what you eat, where you eat, where you learn, what you learn. You know, all of this stuff, bits and pieces, and all these decisions are made for you by other people. You just happen to be there, and by that point, you've pretty much you're pretty much formed as a human being in your terms of your attitude and your mentality. And so I think you know the reason most people are atheists is the same reason most people are are, are, are not or are theists because they just that's the way their life has happened to happens to have gone. I mean, I just didn't I didn't grow up in a religious family. I didn't have any. Uh, idea of religion pushed upon me, but I didn't. I didn't have it pushed away either. You know, I mean, I could have if I'd have been religious, that would have been fine. Um, that would have been a norm. I wouldn't have been. There would have been an issue with that. But um, that's just it. So um, I mean, I, I don't. I never had that passion for it that so, too many. So many people seem to 
to have um because i just felt that you know it just it was it, it wasn't something that i came about with through some <coughs> i didn't have some for want of a better word it, you know religious experience that led me uh led me to to not believing in god i just happened not to uh, so do you have mostly uh, atheists in your circle or do you get along, you know, uh, with non atheists Do you have, do you get along well with like non-atheists or some religious people as well? I get, I get on very well with a lot of them. I mean, to, to me, it's like, I, I, I learned one thing. That's, one thing I've, I, I was, I've come to learn is that a person's politics uh, matters a lot more than what they, what their beliefs are. Because, I mean, I've never met two religious people who have the same beliefs. In, you know, I've never met two Christians who are the same. I've never met two Muslims. I, I've, I think, you know, I, there are as many denominations of Christianity as there are people who claim to be Christian because each one of them will have bits that they ignore, bits that they. Yeah, and I've always looked at it this way: if you let's say you've got four people, and you've got two atheists and two Christians in a room, but one of the Christians is very conservative, one of the Christians is very liberal, and one of the atheists is very conservative, and one of the <coughs> One of the atheists is very liberal. I guarantee you that the the two liberal, the two liberals will be more likely to get on with each other <laughs> than they will the two Christians, and then the two conservatives will get on well with each other more than likely just the two. That you know that will be the thing that generally tends to get them, uh, tends to unite yeah. people. And um, and that ten- and and when you look at the world, that tends to be the thing that does unite people uh, is a lot more is their individual. I mean, most of the people who are involved in like secular movements and stuff like that, they tend to be people who are religious if you go and look at you know uh, you know you go look at any, any any area of politics if there's going to be a mix of people you'll find you'll find loads of you know you look at is we've got this stuff in the news recently about israel and palestine and it's all it always gets drawn down to mean jews and muslims but that's absolute nonsense because mm-hmm. there's loads of jewish organizations who are you know jews jews in support of palestine or jews against the Israeli government or whatever, or Jews against the Iraq, and you'll get people, that, there's Muslims, Muslims for Israel, yeah. is an organisation <laughs> that exists, and so, or Christian it, or, Tur- or, or yeah, yeah, exactly, or t- Turkey's voting yeah. for Christmas, I think would be a better <laughs> one for that, but, um, but yeah, but I mean, so, so I find that people, like, I, I know lots of, um, I don't know lots of religious people, I mean, I, mean, I, don't, I don't tend to, but I tend not to bring it up, really, I mean, I, I tend not to, it's not something I'll make a deal, a big deal out of, or ask about. Um, I mean, my my sister's got my sister is married to a guy whose parents are very sort of like uh, Irish Protestant mm-hmm. and very sort of you know strict and that. And when when it was my sister went to my sister's wedding, my mum told me I was banned from talking to them <laughs> other than anything from anything from a yes or a no. Do not talk to them. Just walk away. And they know that I they know that I do stand up comedy, but they don't know any more than that because I can't. <laughs> Obviously, I'm doing a show called Eat a Queer Fetus for Jesus. There's not really a lot you want to sort of go into uh, about that. But, yeah, I mean, no, I've, uh, t- uh, interestingly, with stand-up over the last sort of 10 years, um, since, obviously, like 9-11, uh, there's been a big sort of, there's been a, a big influx of Muslim stand-up, um, of a lot more Muslims doing stand-up. At the time, there was only really one or two who were doing it, but now there's a lot more, and that, there's always been a, you know, Jew, there's always been a bigger Jewish uh, uh, element in um, stand-up, but I mean, uh, a lot of that, a lot of them aren't really uh, aren't religious in any way. Um, but yeah, and there's only a couple of I do know a couple of there's been a couple of Christian uh, comedians, only a few. But um, yeah, so but yeah, I, I've I've never I've never had a problem. I'll get on very well. I'll get on well with anyone. I just tend not to. I tend to think that if someone tells me they believe in God, my thing is like. Okay, and what else? That's not enough for me because there's like there's no there's nothing I can infer beyond that. You know, I don't know. They might be a very nice. They might be they might be all for equality and uh, you know and, uh, and people with equal rights and uh, all this other stuff. They might be per- oh they might just be a, a nice massive pain in the ass. And so you're going to have to go into you're going to have to get to know people a lot better before you can make any judgment. I feel. And what's your opinion about like? Uh like more like like a certain spirituality that's not necessarily like dogmatic but like like meditation yeah. or just reaching like a state of mind that's yeah, more I mean, like I a, mean that, that's all I mean that's all well and good I mean it's I'm, I'm of the opinion that you know if it gets you through your day then fair play to you I mean I'm not gonna I mean I'm, I'm talking as a, I mean I'm speaking as a guy who uh is who spent 12 years as, a, as with, with severe substance abuse problems and 
at the end of the day, it's like, and I'm, I'll clear, I'm, I'm clear, I've cleared up now, and I've been clean for a while. But you, you sort of realize, I sort of realize after a while, it's like, what is the fundamental difference between someone who takes drugs and someone who believes in God? There is, I mean, in terms of like what you do, I mean, you're both, you're, I mean, a, a, a drug. People that say belief in God or belief in the supernatural is a delusion but if anything taking drugs is a chemical delusion it's you putting yourself because you're changing your state of mind you're making you're altering your uh, your emotional and your physical and your mental state you're creating this distorted perception of the world around you uh, that might make you feel better and it might make you get 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 you through uh, you know get you through life a lot better but it's just as not it's still not real um, but, but at the same time you know, you're not going to get someone who's who's choking on his own vomit because he's had too much faith injected into his. He's, he's had too much Jesus. You're not going to get some guy going out and robbing old robbing old people's homes and stealing from people because because they need to get some Jesus in them. I don't know. Um, so yeah, so I think we we all we're all sort of of that. Of, we all sort of have that in us. Uh, just some of us deal with it. I suppose in a way, if I look back on it, I mean, I'm not trying to say you know, you know, I'm not saying we, you know, forgiving people's having because people do have. Uh, rather uh, whacked out uh, crazy beliefs that can be dangerous. Um, but I think that's within all of us. I think the danger is, do you think, do people think, this happens a lot with atheists too, they seem to think because they don't believe in God that they are purely rational beings that are, that are, uh, uh, that cannot be, um, uh, are unsusceptible to, to it, to, you know, non, and the fact is, I don't, I don't think, I don't think that's the case at all. I think we all are. We, I mean, psychologists will tell you that all human beings are delusional to an extent. We always seem to think we've got, you know, the, the way we've, with the, the opinions and the ideas we've got, we've figured it all out. We've got it, you know, because we wouldn't have the opinions and the ideas we do. Um, but as far as people who, I mean, people who just believe in that old airy fairy spirituality, the stuff is quite vague. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. I mean, if it's like, if if it's if it gets them like about like about like uh, reaching a certain state of mind rather than actually like a force like the, like a state of mind that's like irrelevant to whether there's like some kind of actual like force or yeah. Pain. I mean, but, like, just, I mean, the thing is that that's kind of I mean that's, it goes back to the a lot of people will do that. a lot of people do that with drugs though a lot of people take mushrooms don't they and they go. And they go, oh yeah, man, I'm on another level. I mean, I'm seeing the things, I'm seeing the world. I was like, no, no, you're seeing shit that isn't there. I'm like, yeah, but it is there, but we just can't see it because it's not really there. You know, it's like, that's the sort of, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, the thing is meditation. I mean, meditation and all these other things, they do tend to, uh, they do, t they do tend to put us in certain, I mean, people do have, you know, states of euphoria that are brought out by religious experience. And they're not, it doesn't mean that the religious experience <laughs> is real, is caused by any, it just means that they, they might, I mean, your mind is, that's how powerful your mind is. Your mind will tell you, you know, if your mind tells you what you're feeling, then you'll feel that, you know, uh, you see that with, you see that with like mass hysteria. You know, if you ever see like situations of mass hysteria where people are told like, you know, there's a, or oh, there's an infectious outbreak and this, you're going to get these symptoms and these symptoms, mm -hmm. then people start exhibiting those uh, symptoms and they haven't got anything. Um, it's just their mind is telling them, is telling them that. So it's, 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 it's kind of, it's, uh, I said, that stuff doesn't bother me. I'm, I'm of the opinion like, you know, if, if it does, doesn't bother me, then it's a, it should be like anything in the world. If it doesn't bother me, then I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to worry about it, you know, and I don't see a lot of, I mean, some bloke, <coughs> some bloke putting some sandals in, sandals on and sitting in his back garden in a yogurt position, Indian, <laughs> uh, <it's> like <laughs> sitting down cross-legged Indian style. I don't see him, he's not going to be much of a problem. So if it's getting him through the day, yeah. then let him, leave him alone. Stop bothering him. <laughs> yeah. He's not hurting anyone. Well, it's just because it's just like, you know, I've, I've met people who are uh, atheists that like kind of, they they don't believe in a god or anything like that, but they they kind of find like uh, they kind of enjoy like you know meditation or yeah. just being more present and yeah. that kind of thing because it it's kind of like I guess it's like a way of just kind of like appreciating the world around you, irrelevant to whether there's uh, a god or not. Yeah, I mean the thing is, it's like everyone's going to have to find something that gets. I mean, I don't care what anyone, this idea yeah. about. Rea I mean, the truth is reality. If you start really looking at reality. 
and the world around us, it, it's actually very depressing. And it's, it's, <laughs> and it's not, it's not the easy, the idea that the, I mean, from with human beings is we've become, we, we're too intelligent for our own good. And we have to create this idea that there's a reason for us here. Cause otherwise, if there is no, a lot of people create this idea because you, like, whilst it doesn't bother me personally, I can see why it would be a bit of a bummer if you came to the conclusion that, right, so we're just sort of here. We weren't put here for any reason. There's no, we don't go anywhere afterwards. And we just basically, we just breed and we die. Right. Okay. And that's it. Now that does, that I can see why a lot of people would find that a bit of a bump, bit of a buzzkill. Um, me, I, I don't. I mean, I sort of, I, I, my, my attitude, I don't sort of have this idea. This people sort of say that, oh, there's no meaning to life. I'm like, that's kind of a good thing to me because it means I can sort of do whatever I feel like without having to work. Not, not, not in the extreme. Not so I'm, well, you can make your own, well, you can make your own. Well, you can make your own meaning. Your, I mean, you know, yeah, it depends I mean, on your attitude. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't sort of go for the idea that. that my life has meaning because I've given it one. I mean, I just sort of go for the idea that, you know, there's no, because there's no judgment. It's like, if I can't, yeah. you know, no matter how many times anyone tells me this is, if, if there's no real way, if there's no real objective definition of right or wrong, then you, then it's your way to figure it out. You know, as you get this with like a lot of things, with like things like drugs and uh, abortion is another issue, where there's this, you know, with the religious people and with a lot of, and there are, there are atheist, um, uh, pro-life groups and stuff like that. It's, there's this objective right and wrong. And it's like, no, there's not. You know, I mean, there's, and the thing is that, if, if, if it's an objective right and wrong in your mind, but I mean, in, in my mind, there's like, there's, there's a gray area to there and it's like each case has to be taken in its own sort of individuality. I mean, it's quite nihilistic in a way, I suppose, my outlook, but I'm not sort of like, I never understood nihilists to bang on about it because you just bang on about nihilism because you think, well, ultimately it doesn't matter anyway. So why, <laughs> why, why would you, <laughs> if you believe that it's all meaningless, why are you trying, <laughs> why are you just going on about it? Um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, so I, I, I said my my outlook's one like I, I suppose I'm a bit more cynical than I used to be about my yeah. outlook of the world, um, but I sort of have this vague. I suppose if I've got one delusion, it's that it's, it's I'm deluded by the sense that I believe human beings can learn to do the right thing. You know, and, yeah, um, yeah, there's well, and, hope. And, and and human beings really can't learn to do the right thing unless they look at what's wrong in the world, unless they you know look at the world as it is. You yeah. Know? Well, again, that's the problem. Like, again, again, that's the problem with yeah. life. Is it like I was saying with stand up earlier when I was talking about stand up and and having sex? Is like being alive is something we learn to do whilst we're doing it. We don't get a sort of like yeah. we're not given a rundown sheet or a script or anything beforehand. We we've got no idea, and then we don't get to come back and go back and do it all over again. So this is why progression. This is why it takes so long for us to sort of progress and do things, you know, to get to that, because we have to sort of, every time you have a new generation, they've got to start all over again. And uh, you've got to, you know, and so it takes, the, it, it, this is why it takes time, a long time for things to uh, evolve, uh, to the society um, to evolve into things like, I mean, you can see it happening. I mean, you can see it now in America, like with the, um, like uh, gay people in, in America that now are sort of being more, you know, much more accepted and much more mm -hmm. sort of, you know, they're getting a lot more, uh, you know, gay, gay, like gay marriage, gay, uh, gay, uh, gay rights and stuff like that is happening a lot quicker. And you see this happening a lot. And you certainly see this with, um, the extreme, uh, right, uh, far right seem to be, you know, they're getting louder. Uh, but that's only because they're running out of steam. And so the people, the few of them that are left seem to be getting louder and louder. So you can, it can appear that there's a lot more of them out there, but there's actually not. And, and that's a good, and that's sort of this us progressing down that sort of road. I mean, once you get to the, you know, and, and, and I, I'm sort of accepting of that. I mean, I, I'm at an age now where there's certain words now that I can't say anymore that I used to be able to say when I was a kid, but I can't say anymore. And I thought like, I could turn into one of those miserable old farts who just whinges about everything, <laughs> who sits and goes, Oh, you can't. Oh, when I was a kid, we could say spastic and nignog and walk and all this other stuff and nobody cared. Or I could just go along with it and go like, right, you know, and just progress and evolve because I mean, and that's sort of, you know, change is inevitable, and uh, and 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 young people are better than you, so you have to sort of like, <laughs> that's the one of the things you have to learn that. So you just carry on, you know. Yeah. So out of all the um, extreme extremist groups you've dealt with, uh, who have been the most frustrating and why? Um. Well, I mean, I suppose the frustrating in terms of just being unable to talk to them is there's a group. 
who don't really have a name. I mean, they're just another, they're another brand of, of, of white supremacist. Um, but they're, they're, the name I came up to them was the White Genotards. And um, the reason I call the reason I call them that is they're basically their whole thing is that there's this there's a white genocide happening. There's a genocide of white people. Uh, of, oh, they're com- anti-racist, anti-white. Uh, anti, yeah, they, and their mantra yeah. is anti-racist is code for anti-white. And um, and they've got a whole mantra. And I've just never encountered a group of people who you can't who who won't let you engage with them in any on any level. Like, all they do is, like, and I went on one of their websites um, and looked at their forum, and they've got this thing, it's like, and th- there's a picture on their forum saying, where did you copy and paste the mantra today? And this is all they do. They copy and paste this <laughs> mantra out, which is anti-racist code for anti-white, and there's a whole thing, and they just copy and paste it on as many websites and blogs and forums all day, and then report back, and it's just like the most random stuff. It's like, oh, I went on the, you know, I went on the crux uh, you know, dog show uh, forum, and we went on this horticultural website, and we went on this other stuff, and they're just like, <laughs> and that's all they put, and, and you know, you, you just sit there, just frustrated, saying, look, you know, I, none of your, you, first of all, your entire mantra makes no sense, logically, even in certain, you know, you, you break it down, it's complete nonsense, but other than that, even if it did, you're never going to convince people by just copy and pasting any, anything down, and, and, and just like no matter how many times I've tried to just you know talk to them, they just won't. Uh, but I was I, the one thing was on one of their websites they had this thing for um, <coughs> uh, uh, there for the anti-white uh, person of the year, and I was nominated, and I did, I didn't win. <laughs> and I was so <laughs> fucking pissed off. <laughs> so I considered I considered getting people to sort of flood the website and vote for me, but um. But yeah, so but uh, th- th- no, it's just these people just they they they're locked off in their own little in their own little uh, zone, and they've just you know they think this is gonna this is what they're gonna have to do. They think if they just copy and paste this over and over again, um, it's get so they're they're easily the most frustrating to deal with. Uh, but even even people like the BNP, English de- members of the English Defence League, or other political extremes, I've, I've I've been able to engage them in some way. You know, I have been able to, uh, you know, reach them in some way, and um, you know, and I've, I've, I've even had, I've even had, you know, messages from them saying that I've deconverted them. So I know that I can reach them. But like these other people, these uh, these the white genotards, I've just never been able to sort of. But they're, they're just their brains are impenetrable to absolutely anything. And, and then your comedy name was uh, that that show you're doing. That was a combination of like the different things they've called you, right? Like, or they they throw around like uh, the MRAs yeah. say mangina. <laughs> Yeah, the mangina. I mean, the MRAs tend to have they they've got generally it's a combination of of, of pussy chasing white knighting mangina <laughs> is the full is the full one which I just never understand. Uh, no, I mean, I've got I've literally had a guy at an MRA sort of say to me, he's like, he's like, you only you only defend or support feminism because you know you're trying to get laid, and I'm like. Let's say that that's true. Where did this become a bad thing? Did I miss a meeting? Did there like was there a big man meeting where suddenly it was like a quite you know, going, going out and trying to get laid was all of a sudden a fucking this was a, this was an issue. I don't. I must have missed that memo. And um, but yeah, uh, but I mean, if that, even if that was the case, uh, and uh, and if, even if it was true, um, I'd certainly prefer that to being one of them. So I mean, this is a. <coughs> So I could live with that, you know. And uh, have you encountered like any of these groups in real life, or? No, not at all. No, not at all. They they, they say they they say they'll come and get you, and they'll <laughs> they'll stab you, and they'll and they'll slice you up. But they they never. They, I mean, it's not like I wouldn't mind. It's not like I'm hard to find. I mean, I I, I whenever I do a gig anywhere, I advertise it quite publicly. You know, if I'm doing a, you know, when I do the Edinburgh Festival, I'm basically telling them like for three weeks on the trot, I will be at this address. From these, from this out, from this time, you know, from the hours of, you know, from the hours of ten thirty to to midnight, I will be there at that room every day, um, at this place. I've done, and not one of them has ever, not had a single person turn up, not even, a, not even just a random loony throw throw something at me, not nothing. I've, um, I did have one guy threaten, uh, I did have one guy threaten to uh, stab me on Twitter. Uh, in, in come and find me in Edinburgh, and I found out this guy is actually a, an English Defence League, a former well Scottish Defence League, 
uh, member who was in ja- who was jailed for threatening to stab his girlfriend, and uh, and he's sending me and he's sending me threats on Twitter. Wow. So I just linked him to a gig saying I'll be there. These are the best. <laughs> you know, I have this bizarre I have this bizarre fascination, this fantasy of like you know being killed on stage. That it's like. <laughs> It's like, it's like, you know, I know it sounds it sounds morbid as hell, but it's like, if whenever I have this, like, if whenever it says, how would you prefer to die? It's like, I want to be assassinated. Like, it was always my, I always want to be randomly killed on, like, you know, um, on stage, taken out. And um, and if no one actually was going to, if I couldn't find anyone to actually organise my own, I'd, just sort of like, I'd leave it that way. And then if anyone found out it was me, then that would just make the mystery even better, you know. And, um, well, that'd be sure to increase your fan base. Exactly, right? and yeah, also, yeah, like, who's this comedian? Exactly. Well, that's <laughs> the great. That's the great thing about being about once you're dead is like you know if you die, particularly in a mysterious or a very sort of big big way like that, like you're assassinated and you're not famous, you immediately all my all the work all the stuff I've already done will become much more important and interesting than it, or, than it actually is. People will breathe much more into it. And I'll be able to sort of like achieve a level of fame without actually having to do any work because I'll be dead, which sort of appeals to my inherent laziness. So, so yeah, I'm all for that, you know. And uh, so being an atheist, how do you feel about letting children believe in things when they're little kids that don't necessarily exist, like Santa... Leprechauns or the Easter Bunny? Do you... Well, the thing is, kids are going to believe in things that don't exist, whether you tell them that or not. I mean, I, 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 I this whole thing. Anyone who thinks that the, I, I, I think it could, it, it's a good thing actually to teach kids about things like that, as long as you teach them that it's all in your imagination. I mean, you can, you can teach kids to, I mean, kids run around and, you know, talk to things that ain't there all the bloody time. As far as Father Christmas goes, I believed in Father Christmas. I'm pretty sure most people do to some extent. There's a lot, I think there's a lot more fuss made about it than, the thing about Father Christmas is, you know, Father Christmas is easy to disprove after a while. I mean, it's like, because Father Christmas is supposed to be someone who literally comes into your house at night (laughs) and then, and then, puts presents under your, and and there comes a point as a kid when you're going to figure out that it's actually not Father Christmas uh, doing that. Um, And also, and even then there's going to come a point when you grow up and you've got to actually buy presents for people. And and then you've got to get, you know, so the the idea that this is like, this is a damaging thing. I mean, kids are, you know, know, people have this fear of like, um, of things that are, you know, because of this, one of the one of the symptoms of this um, sort of militant movement atheism that I've found is there's this there's this overbearing fetishization of of being rational and logical and reasonable one hundred and fifty percent of the time you must and I'm like no there's like some great things have come out of people who are just f- from being completely illogical yeah. and being completely irrational I mean in, from terms of like <clears throat> I mean also being logical isn't always a good thing I mean I could say that. You know, I mean, you could say logically, okay, you want to eliminate, um, okay, so if you want to end the Israel-Palestine conflict, let's just bomb and <laughs> kill all the Palestinians. You know, that will end, and that is, and let, now that's logical, yeah. right, isn't it? I mean, that's a logical conclusion, like, you just kill it's all just the Palestinians. The if you want to end, <laughs> yeah, if you want to end, if you want to end racism, it's simple, kick out all the black people. Yeah. There you go, there's no, no, no yeah. like, there's it's a logical, like how um, Walter White was, uh, logical to the extreme where he had like no morals uh breaking bad <laughs> exactly yeah well i mean this is the thing i mean our, our, the thing that makes us human beings are is our emotions mm-hmm. and our emotions are not are not reasonable and our emotions are not rational and that you know well they can be sometimes yeah. it's generally well, that's why we have though. you know like art and music and stuff like that yeah so we're, and also you look at some of the great some of the great sort of I mean, look at someone like nikola tesla mm-hmm. who invented you know who's responsible for some of the great some great sort of scientific innovations and inventions and discoveries. But the guy was a mentalist. I mean, on an, on another level, he was absolutely insane. And you know, even even people like um, uh, uh, Isaac Newton, you know, was 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 a bit of a nutter uh, in other aspects and that. And and so there's, there's this fear of it. And some of the great sort of art and um, you know, the great sort of uh, the great sort of art that we're familiar with, music and and things that we're familiar with, and, you know, and films and books and uh, poetry. And even stand up. I mean, it comes from it comes from people who are not thinking, you know, who were thinking outside the box and were thinking a little bit 
you know, think, thinking a little bit sideways, you know, and there's nothing wrong with like, with using that as long as you, as long as it's, uh, as long as it's applied correctly, um, then it's not a dangerous thing. I mean, it's, it's not something that's going to be dangerous. And he- um, I mean, relig- religion and belief in God is nothing more than a byproduct of our human. You know, we've got this desire to know. You know, we hate not knowing things, and then we hate. Uh, then there are things that we can't possibly know, and then we have this desire to sort of like create. And I mean, human beings are imaginative creatures. We create things that aren't there. This is why we have things that we exi- We have things in our everyday life now that two hundred years ago didn't exist and would never. Have, no one would have thought existed. It's because we imagine them and we we decide to create them from that, and so like, and so like because of that, if you're going to have you know if you're going to ask a question like you know why are we here or what what happens when we die, which cannot be answered and you can't know the answer, but you've got an imagination, you're going to fill it in, and so like that's really all a lot of this comes from is like yeah. we we fill in gaps with our own with what we imagine makes the most sense, even if it's not yeah. there's no real basis for it, so. Yeah, and that's, and that's really all it is. Whereas, like a lot of other people, they'll they'll use that their imagination. You know, they will create lots of other things. Will create great uh, yeah. masterpieces and things and bits and pieces. Whereas that you know, most people, if you if you're working forty five, fifty hours a week, you know, do, you know, trying to get by paying the bills with your regular, you know, with your family and your house and your mortgage, you ain't got time to sit around and fucking concoct, you know, a great symphony or, um, <laughs> or learn how to play the or learn how to play the sodding cello or do a do a turn a seascape in watercolors. So you're gonna you're probably gonna sit there and do it in other ways. Um, and, and here's a, here's a, another thing I always thought it's like if it weren't religion that people were using to oppress people, I think it'd be something else. I think it's the problem is human nature to just be assholes to each yeah. other. You know, well. I mean, the, 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 there's, a, there's a myth that goes about. I mean, people are always talking about religion and war, saying, "Oh, religion is the cause of most wars." And actually, it's, it's greed not. And money, religion I is simply. Or... Well, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's generally it's land, it's land, it's resources, it's power. Um, it's it's because people want stuff. I mean, it's because people want a piece of land. They want a, they want the resources that are got. the British Empire was not based on. You know, it was not based on anything other than uh, you know. It was no, there was no religious element to it. We just wanted everything. You know, we went over to China and just took their opium because because we wanted to. We well, you, you look at look at um you know again I mean a lot of people a lot of atheists don't like it when you bring this up but you look at a lot of the uh, a lot of mm-hmm. communist uh, a lot of uh, extreme communist uh, regimes that were very anti religious to the point where they were like killing let's kill they wipe out religious people. Well, um, kind of replace uh, it, it, it kind of replace religion with another religion, political religion, kind of yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and, and the thing is, it's all just like you, religion is not something that existed without us it's, it exists because you know you can't people say we want to get rid of religion i'm like well okay you're going to get rid of religion but do you know how first of all how do you do that and secondly how do you just you know how what do you how do you stop it it's really just as i mean religion if nothing else if you want to look at religion in the worst possible light for me it's i look at it as nothing more than a symptom of 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 human of, of our uh, of the things that are our, our human failings and that it's just it's just a byproduct of it well, what well, I think maybe like if uh, the main problem is maybe how people interpret uh, religion. Maybe there's too much of a literal or literal interpretation when really I think maybe it could be applied to making the world a better place or just being mm. better human. In certain, in certain. Yeah, ways. I mean, I don't care. I mean, if like, someone does know. something, if someone does something good, I don't really care why they do it. I mean, um, I'm yeah. not really too bothered. But I mean. Um, this was the problem I ended up having with a lot of the, the the militant atheist groups online. Is they had this, they had this bizarre thing. Like they would rage against, uh, they would rage against religious people who were extremists, like these uh, these these uh, mm-hmm. fundamentalist groups. And then you'd get these religious people who were much more moderate and much more, you know, modernized and civilized. And their immediate response is to go over them and say, ah, you're not really like that. They're, you know, you've just picked and choosed all the bit. I'm like, why are you having a go at this person, right, for being a civilized human being? You know, be, you're basically going to say, at least the fundamentalists, at least they're following it, following their book a lot more. I'm like, well, bully for them, but they're nutters. I don't want to, I'd rather live in a world filled with intellectually dishonest hypocrites who believe in God and end up, you know, and pick the nice stuff than... And then the people who, who believe in God to you know with an intellectual consistency and and are raging psychopaths. I mean, I just uh, I'm more of a consequentialist, I suppose, in um in what I in the way I view things. Like if it makes if it makes things better, if it makes people better, then 
I'll, 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 I'll stick. I'm all for it. Or like, uh, what was I thinking of? Like Confucianism, like has nothing to do with like a god really, but it's more like a philosophy. Hmm. On, I mean, it has its, it has its, uh, you know, stupid parts, kind of misogynistic yeah. in a lot of ways. But uh, you know, that's. I mean, just. I guess I'm trying to say, like, I guess, like, there's a way, like, you can interpret them more as like philosophies, mm-hmm. and maybe like take take what resonates out mm-hmm. of it as a way to, without necessarily believing. Yeah, I mean, I always say, with, I always say with the Bible, the Bible was always to me, it was like it was like the Johnny Cochran of uh, of, of books, <laughs> because no matter what you believed or didn't believe, or what you supported or didn't support, you could find something in there that would back you up. You know, I mean, it would fight. It's like it's like a very good lawyer. You know, it's like whatever you want to, whatever you want to believe, whatever you want. I mean, and, this, and there's this myth as well about people who are like people talking about the Westboro Baptist Church, and they'll say that, oh well, you know, they're following their Bible a lot better than say a modern. But, but that's not true. They're just following the Old Testament a lot better. Is what they're following. They're following all the nasty, horrible stuff a lot better. You know, they're 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 not they're not loving their fellow man or you know turning the other cheek or doing any of that other. Uh, good stuff. They're, 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 being, they're just they're just following. They're cherry picking just as much as uh, as uh, as anyone else. They cherry pick the horrible stuff. Um, yeah. Well, like like me, like I don't even really believe that uh, you know Jesus ever existed. But like out of the whole Bible, I think like he at least like if you interpret it in a, like a non dogmatic sense, as far as just you know applying it to being a better person yeah. and bettering this world rather than you know heaven and an afterlife mm. i think he i think he had you know some good things to say even as a fic, even if he was just uh, well, i'm always i'm always surprised that jesus is never is never uh picked up on or used by mm-hmm. any anarchist groups as a sort of symbol of what they do because if you look at what jesus did he was if in his day and age he was the he was an anarchist i mean he was all about mm-hmm. taking down the state he was about opposing the state he was about helping Helping the poor, helping the meek, helping those who were. You now he was about. That's what he was about. He was about destroying the establishment, and um, and it, it's bizarre that he's be, he's become a symbol of the establishment, uh, which is again, which is going against everything, most of the things he said. But I mean, yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, as a character, I think there's a lot to be. You can look, if you look at Jesus' just story as a character, and if you imagine it just as a just as a, a book. Uh, and the story, nothing else. You don't look into all the, you don't look at it. But it's, it's 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 very interesting, you know. And yeah, and that's why it's weird that like you know a lot of the the uh, Republicans and whatnot like are like the the Christian right say that they're super followers of uh, Jesus because he's kind of like everything he's they spoke ag- that he spoke against. Oh. Like I would think if you were truly a follower of Jesus, your ideas would be more socialistic. Yeah. But I mean, but again, I mean, this is just um, again, again it's just these people seeing what they they want to they they want to see. I mean, you can, they'll just interpret it how they want it to. I mean, if uh, people can talk about like I remember Rush Limbaugh talking about Jesus and the tax, Jesus and tax. I'm like, if Jesus was around, he would tax you lot by like ninety nine percent. In fact, he wouldn't. He'd insist you give everything up. I mean, his whole thing was like give up your possessions, give them away. You know, and then yeah. and then go go on a go wandering with. I'm sure you'd have to because you'd have no house to live in, so you'd have to go have to go for a walk. But um, so how did you first come across Alex Jones, <laughs> <laughs> and what made you decide to make several parody videos? Of him? Um, well, Alex. Well, I mean, first of all, I mean, you can't. It's impossible to make really. It's impossible to make parodies of Alex Jones, and even <laughs> even my parodies of Alex Jones were. Not really parodies; they were more sort of like impressions, just of Alex Jones, really, because it's it's virtually impossible to do that. I, I mean, I, I used to be a bit of a conspiracy nut um, uh, many many years ago. I, I stopped. I, I mean, it, I, I I tended to. I stopped getting into it. I sort of stopped uh, buying into it a couple of months after I stopped taking cocaine. I don't know whether those two things are connected. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's probably a correlation. There is no doubt a correlation there. But, I mean, I used to be in that, that 9-11 was an inside job and, you know, uh, the moon landing and uh, JFK, all those stuff, all those conspiracies. I was a... Uh, well, 9-11 was very interesting. I mean, I'm, 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 it's, 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 it's fascinating in a way, but... Um, I was never as far to the far to the extremes of Alex Jones, but I was sort of like 
uh, I, I was ne- I was nearing that, but. I suppose when it comes down to, I mean, the thing about the thing about conspiracy theories is they work on the same basis as religion, except the difference is, um, the difference really is the fact that with conspiracy theories, it's um, th- there's a certain there's a much cool conspiracy theories are cool to sort of that there there's an there's an appeal to them, particularly if you're young and you're anti-establishment or you're trying to rage against the machine or whatever. Yeah. What you, you know, there's 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 an appeal there to it because that ties in with that counterculture thing um the problem is it is just it is based on the same load of horseshit that you know anything yeah. else is based on. it's based on assumptions and misinformation and you know just you know twisting twisting stuff to suit your suit an agenda and um and at the end of the day it's all well and good. there's there's enough real at the end yeah. of the day you also realize eventually that conspiracy theories you know, they're actually you're actually helping the establishment by buying into them it's because discrediting any real. Credit. Yeah, it's and also it's just, yeah, it's distracting people away as well. It's distracting people away from things they should really be getting. Because um, like the problem with Alex Jones is he goes to the extreme where like everything's a conspiracy, everything yeah. is planned. But I mean, I mean, for me with Alex, with Alex Jones, I mean, the thing about Alex Jones is he's, he's incredibly he's not anti-establishment at all. I mean, most of the yeah. stuff, most of the, most of the sources when he uses an actual news source, if you will. It's things like the Daily Mail or Fox News. It's things like Breitbart.com. It's these incredibly um, establishment-based uh, 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 news sources. But uh, the, 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 thing, the, thing, the whole thing about Alex Jones, I mean, Alex Jones is like, uh, the thing I always wonder with him is like, what what would the world, what in his mind would the world be? Because everything is like, in, from like every every major news, like every terrorist attack, every war, Every all the all the elections, everything you see on the TV. Got, uh, Sandy Hook was staged too. Yeah, every 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 major every major yeah. incident like that. Even the weather, even the fucking weather is faked yeah. by these. And I'm like, what would the world be like if they weren't doing that? Would yeah. we all just be sat around it and be like, <laughs> chirping like nothing, nobody doing anything? I just yeah. don't understand what uh, what. But like he ter- he manages to tie everything into 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 absolutely anything. And whenever you watch one of his videos, he basically starts off on one. He'll find one issue, and um, like one of the videos I did to him recently, a couple of months ago, was he was he he made a video saying that the word "girl" had been banned in the UK <laughs> for being for being offensive. And I'm like, and it, it wasn't. It what it just wasn't. I can assure you. It was about, just cut off from one segment. Yeah, of the BBC. it was cut off from one segment of a BBC article. That was it. And no, no, none of the people involved really gave a shit. Um, but then you you listen to Alex Jones, and he's by the end of it, he's going on about how our uh, people are being arrested. There are spies in restaurants in Sheffield and London arresting people because they said the word Muslim. You can't have a you can't have a taco party without being. Without being lynched, it's just. Like, and then there wasn't another and, thing he said, uh, like he's putting estrogen. They're putting uh, estrogen in our water to make us gay, or something like putting something. Yeah, he's, he's, yeah. yeah, he basically. Yeah, what, that was one of the first ones I did. Was I think that was the that was the one I did. This is the this is the only thing I need to not take Alex Jones seriously is the fact that he's, he claims that there's there are more gay people around now because of the yeah. stuff governments <laughs> are putting in our food. And you just can't. And the thing that's worrying is, I mean, this guy's got a six. People can laugh. At him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's, he's a laughable figure, but he's got a six-figure income. You know, he's got a six-figure annual income. He's got nearly his YouTube channel's got nearly a million subscribers. And um, you know, it's and and when you look at some of the people who go on his his show, they, a lot of people go on there to get sort of. I mean, like politicians go on I mean Ron Paul used to go on there quite a lot yeah. I mean even not even uh, blokes from UKIP you know from the UK Independence Party not Nigel Farage has been on the Alex yeah. Jones show and um, and so to, to, to dismiss him completely as just this you know, raging big fat blob of, of mental of mentalness would be would be would be easy but it's wrong because he does have he does have more a much further reach than uh, than you would believe yeah. You know, but yeah, so that's right. And also, he's just one of those people who's just, you know, I've done, a, he's easy to do parodies of, and because I just, you put, so I do put them in. Um, but like, yeah, so I, I tend to just sort of like, I've, I've thrown a couple of them. My, the, the, I've done, I did the song about him. I did, the thing about the impression video I did of him was I did, I did claim that 50% of the stuff I was saying was real, stuff Alex Jones had said. <laughs> 
and 50% of it was stuff I made up. And that was actually not true. It was like, all of it was literally stuff Alex Jones had said. Um, I just did that because I wanted to see what Alex Jones fans would say about stuff that I was saying, whether they would sit there and... And because they always like, if you give them that little get out, you, and then you see that they'll try and claim that, you know, oh, you just, you know, Alex Jones would never say that, that, or that, this, that, or the other. And, uh, so what motivates you to keep making videos, and how long do you think you'll keep making? As long as I've got a, a YouTube channel, and as long as I'm physically capable and mentally capable, I'll keep doing it. I mean, it's the, it's something I'm good at. And, and, and beyond, beyond being something I'm good at, it's something that, I think we, I, I mean, everyone wants to sort of come and fight. I'm not, I'm not a revolutionary. I'm not one of these, I'm not someone who's going to change the fucking world. I'm not, a, I'm not a, a Mandela or a Martin Luther King. But, you know, I, I, like, I want to sort of try and do as much. So I think I can do something that's going to uh, try and try and just sort of make the world a better place in my own sort of, in my own mind. I can justify, um, justify what I've, what I've done in my life. I mean, I'm, I said I'm not someone who's gonna go, who's not gonna go. I'm not gonna go off and invent something. I'm not gonna find a cure for AIDS or cancer, and I'm not gonna sort of in, you know, be involved in the next spaceship mission to land on Mars. But what I can do is I can sort of use my experience and what I do in order to sort of promote a, promote a message or put forward an idea that may may in the end at the end of the day help someone uh, you know deal with something or you know or make just make someone laugh. You know, just make someone just for 15 minutes they might forget. You know, that's the, and that's really the thing about that sort of comedy when you stand on stage is for one hour when people are laughing, nothing else suddenly matters anymore. Everything else they've remembered uh, in their life, everything else they're supposed to be worrying about, like, is that, have I got to get that bill paid or am I going to get that report in or this is driving me mad or that's driving me, whatever it is, it goes away because when, la- when, you're, when you're laughing and when you're enjoying yourself, it all disappears. And I'll, I'll, I'll always do it because it, I think at the end of the day, I think if – Whilst you can't put, um, you can't quantify um, the the level of good or the level of bad that you do in your life. You can't sort of put it into units and measure it. You can sort of go like, right, if there was a scale of like, you know, every time I do something bad, it goes down, and every time I do something good, it goes up. Would I be in the positive? You know, would my life sort of, would my existence, you know, has there been a net gain of good of good um, through my existence? And I suppose at this moment, I'd probably say yes. You know, I'd probably say, it might, I don't know how high up it would be, but it's like, it's, 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 uh, there's enough, uh, there's enough examples and there's enough people who I think will remember me and what I've done will be remembered by enough people for, for a, maybe only, maybe only a couple of years after I'm dead, but by the time I'm dead and gone, that's not going to matter to me. Um, but as long as I, as long as I've got the ability to, I'm going to carry on because I, I mean, apart from anything else, I can't do much else with my life. I'm not one. I'm not. I'm not very good at much else. So I, I will always carry on doing stuff like that as long as I've got the uh, got the uh, the means to do so. And uh, what can you say about your podcast, the Left Wing Propaganda Machine, and what uh, was the motivation behind that? Uh, it was just uh, it was just a way of doing something else, really. I mean, it was just another me having a go at something else. I'd, I'd tried podcasts before and never really found an idea that stuck <coughs> and then just decided I thought right well if I just stick to something simple I'll just go through the news and uh, find enough news stories and if I can fill up a uh, 40 minute uh, th- like 30 to 45 minute podcast with it every couple of weeks that'll be it I mean um, it's just another means of me it's just another outlet it's another way for me to sort of um, uh, put everything out there because sometimes one thing one thing that tends to happen uh, when it's like, I can't, I'll, I'll find something, I'm like, oh, that's good, I'd like to talk about that, but it's not really worth a video, you know, it's not a video, there's not a video as well, so if I just take all these little bits and pieces and put them into something, it, uh, and then I put them all together at the end of a week or so, and it's like, right, I can talk about all this stuff, and um, again, it, 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 again, it's just another, it's just another way for me to uh, uh, find, to, to uh, another outlet for me to sort of put myself and put my ideas out there, and, um, and to carry on doing, and also, you know, eventually from that, you know, a lot of stuff, something else can stem from that, you know, there's a lot of stuff I've done, you know, there's a lot of stand-up material I've done that stemmed from something that happened online, um, and, uh, so that's, that's it really, I mean, I just, I just came up, and it, this one seems to, this seems to work, this, this format, so I'll be giving that, I did do a thing, a couple of years ago, I did a thing called the Dick's O'Clock News, 
that ran for like, I think it was three months. I, I ran it once a week for three months. And it was very popular, but I ended up not having the time to do it anymore. Uh, so I always wanted to bring that back. So I figured uh, doing, doing it as a podcast that's a 45-minute podcast where I basically just take random news stories and just uh, uh, just uh, put my uh, two cents in on it or just report on, uh, you know, sort of uh, report those on it in whatever, in my own little way, then um, something may come of that, something may not. But, I mean, you know, just uh, I'm doing it just because it's there and, uh, and uh, it seems to be working. And uh, what can you say about the music you've recorded on the side and when did you first develop <laughs> a passion for music? <laughs> I've never really had a passion for music as such. I mean, I, I, when, when, I, I, when I was uh, younger, I learned to play the guitar, um, and that was it, really. Um, I never really l- went into the idea of getting into a band. I'm, I mean, I haven't got much of a voice um, for it. Um, and uh, nothing, I ever, nothing I ever wrote was groundbreaking enough. But, I mean, the music, I mean I've actually only done, I actually put it together, I've only done, in terms of YouTube, when you look at the YouTube, the songs I've done on YouTube, I've only done about 12 songs. They just, they tend to be, they tend to have been quite popular ones. Obviously the um, most popular one uh, being the Nazis Without Aptitude um, original, um, <laughs> the original song there. Uh, that was the most popular one and the subsequent two ones from that. But yeah, I mean, I'm not a... Um, Occasionally, uh, songs are not something that I sort of tend to set out to do. It's like generally, if I've got an idea and I'm like, right, how how can I put this across? I'll try certain things before I get to it, and a song generally will be generally. I, I can't write a song about something until I until I know it well enough that it sort of just rolls off quite easily. Because um, when you look at the things I've done, songs about they're things <coughs> they're things that I talk about virtually most of the time. Um, I've done two like I've done, I've done two Alex Jones songs. I've done. I did a, I did, I did a, I've done a song about the English Defence League. I did a song about, um, I did a song about David Duke, um, the, uh, oh, former yeah. KKK <laughs> leader and stuff. Well, it was when he was running for president, he was going to run for president. So mm. I did a, um, I did a, I did a presidential campaign song for him. And, um, just little things like that, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I don't, I don't really have a, a passion for it as such. I've got a ukulele as well, which I've been playing, uh, occasionally, which I've, I've muck around with. But, I'm not. I'm not a brilliant. I'm not brilliant uh, at it. And it just occasionally, I just I, uh, I think of something. I've I've actually been working. The next song I'm going to be doing on. I'll give you an exclusive on this one. So uh, and this is. I'm working on a cover of Intergalactic by the Beastie Boys, oh, nice. but it's called is. It, but it's called Islamophobic, oh, okay. and by the Beastie Boys. Um, <laughs> <is the former. laughs> and I just had this idea ages ago. It's, generally, it starts with one simple idea that pops in your head then the rest of the song stems from it and it was just this idea I was like I had that tune in my head and I just started sort of humming going Islamophobic scary Muslims Muslims scare me Islamophobic and I just had that with it and I thought right there's got to be something in there so but the, yeah, I'm sure that'll be um, I'm sure that'll be out at some point or another but that'll be the next one I'm working on so uh, any final thoughts or things you'd like to say or... um did you, uh, no, not really, mate. I mean, uh, it's been it's uh, it's always fun to uh, sit around and reminisce about everything and uh, talk about everything. I mean, um, I, I will say this to anyone: if anyone out there is looking to get into, particularly with the YouTube stuff, I mean, uh, all I'll say to you is just you know, do, come on here realizing one thing that you you are your own you're your own put on the internet uh, on the internet. All all people are created equal. You know, and it doesn't matter how many subscribers or followers or Facebook pages someone's got, you know, that doesn't make them their, your, that does not make anyone on here your superior. And there is, there, no one is your a true superior. So when you come on here, be your own person and don't, don't, don't let anyone else, uh, don't try and let anyone else sort of like tell you what you can and cannot say. Try and, don't let anyone else push you around or try and influence you. Just, you know, do what you want, do what you want to do and do it because you want to do it and uh, do it right, you know. All right. Well, uh, that does it for this episode of BSing with Sean K. Dick, it was great to have you on. Thank you very much. And, uh, yeah, I should have more interviews coming soon. Uh, Stay tuned.